It's really nice to have you all with us today. Uh, my name is Ann Owens. I'm an associate professor of sociology and public policy and an associate director of the Sol Price Center for Social Innovation here at USC. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce the first in our social innovation speaker series of the year. And today we're really thrilled to welcome Dr. Chris Herring. Dr. Herring is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard's Inequality in America Initiative currently. And next year he'll be joining uh, the local community over at UCLA as an assistant professor of sociology. So we're really excited to have this chance to learn about his work and connect with him. Um, he received his PhD in sociology from UC Berkeley and his research focuses on homelessness, housing, welfare, and criminal justice in US cities. So today we are delighted that we'll be able to hear about Dr. Herring's research on the intersection of welfare, criminal justice, and homeless policies in San Francisco. Dr. Herring will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So if you have a question as the talk proceeds or um, at the conclusion of the talk, please use the uh, Q&A box um, in your Zoom app, and then I'll moderate the Q&A, and we'll get through as many as we have time for. So Chris, we're really delighted to have you, and I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks for the invitation, Anne, and uh, for Stacy and others who helped me prepare for this. Uh, the talk I will be presenting today is entitled Between Street and Shelter, Welfare and Criminal Justice Treatments of Homelessness in San Francisco. And I'll start in January of 2018 where Lalani Farr, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing and Human Rights, visited San Francisco. During her visit, she reported, quote, there's a cruelty here that I don't think I've seen. Sweeping people off the streets, whether they live in tents on sidewalks or in their cars, is cruel and inhumane treatment. San Francisco, one of the wealthiest jurisdictions in the world, can certainly do far better than this, unquote. She is right. San Francisco has more anti-homeless laws on its books than any other California city, with 24. In the eight years leading up to the pandemic, dispatches by police for homeless complaints increased by 75%, and the SFPD doubled the number of officers whose full-time job is to address homeless complaints from 23 to 52 officers. Just five days before the rapporteur's visit, at the mayor's MLK Day address, the director of the Department of Homelessness celebrated the city as a national leader in homeless services, telling the crowd, quote, this year's record funding level recognizes the great work that our city and nonprofit partners are engaged in and a welcome investment in our work helping our homeless. And indeed, in San Francisco has more supportive housing units per capita than any other major US city. It shelters more of its homeless than nearly every large West Coast city. In the five years leading up to the pandemic, invested over a billion dollars in homeless services and housing, leased 1,500 units of supportive housing, and created over 500 new shelter beds. So in today's talk, I want to provide an overview of how these recent policy developments have impacted homelessness in San Francisco to help us rethink the relationship between punishment and care, welfare and criminal justice strategies addressing homelessness. I think the lessons over these recent years can help us evaluate some of the new proposals that are emerging in this post-pandemic moment, particularly in places like San Francisco, LA, and other West Coast cities. For instance, in just the past few weeks, some of you may have heard headlines about San Francisco Mayor London Breed's emergency ordinance to address the nasty streets of the Tenderloin neighborhood. That includes, among other things, an aggressive policing approach towards street homelessness and new services. Just last week in LA, city supervisors considered a new ordinance limiting public camping in the lead up to a mayoral election. In Sacramento, city supervisors will soon consider an ordinance providing a right to shelter that also includes an obligation for those unhoused to accept it. Meanwhile, Governor Newsom recently announced a budget that includes $2 billion focused on temporary shelter and encampment resolutions. Now, at the heart of all of these proposals is a simultaneous expansion of shelters and police to address visible homeless. And this policy approach um, combining these is premised on a number of assumptions that I want to begin with. First is an underlying narrative I think many of you might be familiar with, uh, and observers across the political spectrum frequently claim that San Francisco and other progressive cities have reduced or even ended the criminalization of homelessness. San Francisco has decreased its jail population by over 70%, ended cash bail, 
elected progressive DAs, expanded alternative sentencing programs, and no longer arrests for public drug use in public. Liberals point to these facts to claim their cities do not punish the poor, while conservatives blame these policies uh, for enabling urban disorder. Second, is that progressive cities spend too much on homeless services. Shelter beds are available and adequate. The problem is the poor choice and resistance of those experiencing homelessness. Therefore, politicians promote a philosophy of coercive benevolence in which the sticks of criminalization are seen as necessary to push people towards the carrots of shelter and rehab. And third, is that because of this, shelter expansion can only be successful with increased policing. So my research challenge is uh, that I'll, uh, each of these assumptions. First, I'll argue that the criminalization of homelessness not only persists, but at least in San Francisco, it has increased. It's just that the policing and punishment takes different forms. And so I seek to provide a fresh account of how the punitive management of poverty can persist under conditions of decarceration, criminal justice reform, and welfare expansion in a progressive city with devastating consequences for those unhoused. Second, I found that policing was completely unnecessary to fill San Francisco's new shelters. Demand vastly outstripped supply. More surprising, though, was that I found that rather than decreasing the policing of homelessness in public space, increased shelter provision was instead used to expand and promote intensified policing and punishment towards those unhoused. And finally, in contradiction to the belief that policing incentivizes the uptake of shelter and services, I found that increased criminalization did far more to undermine investments in efforts of medical care, behavioral health treatment, and created barriers to accessing housing, employment, and services. Uh, so to make these arguments, I'll trace the evolution of policy innovations and in welfare aimed at shelters and criminal justice reforms aimed at street homelessness in three moves. Uh, it's an evolution that takes place over five years leading up to the pandemic in San Francisco, which I think offer important lessons to the current debates over using shelter and police to resolve encampments today. So the first half of the talk discusses the problems with shelter and policing when I began my research in 2014 and 2015, and many of the same problems persist to this day in San Francisco and other cities. The second part of my talk then examines uh, reforms and innovations implemented to address these problems, including the rollout of new low barrier shelters and increased coordination between police and other city agencies in addressing encampments. In the third part, I'll discuss how over time, the new shelters increasingly became oriented away from the needs of the unhoused to focus on the complaints of house residents and businesses interested in clearing public spaces, how shelter placement shifted out of the hands of social workers and into the hands of politicians and police, how sanitation and public health efforts were increasingly used to disguise punitive camp evictions, and finally, how the growing dominance of a punitive approach undermined efforts of social services, housing placement, medical care, and addiction treatment. So most of what I'll be discussing today um, is uh, drawn from ethnographic observations that braids together the standpoints of the unhoused and those who manage them. One year was spent studying homeless regulation from below. I spent 57 nights sleeping in encampments, 96 nights in shelters, and hundreds of days following people as they acquired food, resources, and interacted with the welfare and justice systems. Another year was devoted to studying the field of homeless management from above through observations on ride-alongs with police, public health workers on outreach, sanitation workers on sweeps, and social workers in shelters. Uh, the research offers perspectives working both within the state and against it. So after completing my field work on the street level, I worked for three months as a research assistant to the mayor's director of homelessness in the city hall. There, I analyzed administrative data, attended meetings, and drafted policy positions. And over the course of my six years of research, I also participated as an organizer with the San Francisco Coalition on Homelessness. There I attended weekly meetings, carried out street and shelter outreach, coordinated direct actions, and worked with city supervisors on legislation. My talk will also draw on other data. In particular, our two community-based studies I co-directed in partnership with other academics and the Coalition on Homelessness. Both hired currently and formerly unhoused individuals to conduct the surveys and in-depth interviews and were designed and analyzed in partnership with organizers. I also draw, you'll see on some Public Record Act requests of internal government emails and millions of 911 and 311 records. 
All right, so I'll begin uh, giving a picture of the limits of shelter and policing and wanna walk you through the situation of shelter scarcity and their problems of access. In San Francisco, nearly 10,000 people experience homelessness on any given night. However, the city has only uh, 3,400 available shelter beds. On a typical day in 2019, there were more than 1,200 people on San Francisco's single adult shelter wait list for a guaranteed shelter bed. Reaching the top of the list typically takes between one to two months. Once a bed is obtained, the person will be required to exit after 90 days, get back on the list, and wait for another one to two months. Now, without a guaranteed bed, one can always seek a single night bed, but we'll have to wait in the line, like the one photographed here, that uh, typically took between four to eight hours. Now, I myself uh, never took a bed away from someone seeking a one night bed uh, during my field work, uh, but did manage to stay the first five to eight days at the beginning of each month, the only nights where there were vacancies as people received their monthly checks, allowing them to take a break by staying with friends or a hotel room for a couple of nights. Now, during these long waits, I was sexually harassed, robbed, verbally abused, and threatened with violence, and observed the same happen to others on nearly a daily basis. When beds ran out, as they did every night except for the first days of the month, after waiting hours, I'd sleep in chairs with dozens of others or under the shelter's awning. Most shelters had wake-up calls at 7 a.m. and remained closed until their evening curfews. And so here's a photo of the SF Central Library, where many of those in shelters relocate, relocate during the day. Besides access were the conditions. People were limited to bringing in only a backpack, segregated by gender, not allowed to keep pets, restricted from bringing in their own food or drink, and had to be in by the nightly curfew. So these conditions deterred people like Randall, who at 46 years of age, had spent 10 years circulating between the streets and short-term rentals. Randall eventually entered one of the navigation centers I'll go on to speak about. However, when I first met him in the city's Bayview neighborhood while I was camping and recycling, he swore he'd never return to shelter. Uh, one night he explained to me, bunk beds, 100 people in a room, everyone getting into fight, staff treats you like a piece of shit, food's just as bad as prison, only smaller portions. With the curfew, there'd be no way I could recycle like now. If I wanted to visit a friend or lady more than once a month, I'd lose my bed. It seemed like no one would get housing, and those who did, you had no clue why. Life is way better out here. Others would bounce between street and shelter more frequently. In one of our survey studies, we found that the majority of respondents currently residing outside either regularly use shelter when it is available or have tried to access shelter and had been rejected. And in a survey of 316 San Franciscans who were currently experiencing homelessness on the street or in their vehicles, we found that 15% had been sheltered at some point in the last month, more than 40% had utilized shelter in the past year, and 81% had either used or tried to access shelter in the past. So in contrast to the HUD point in time counts that portray a static perception of sheltered and unsheltered homelessness, the reality is that there is a high rate of churn between street and shelter. Now I wanna to shift to the limits of policing. And I'll begin with an ethnographic um, uh, observation during one of my ride-alongs. So it's 6 a.m. and officers Rodriguez and Sharkey are beginning their morning shift from San Francisco's Mission Police Station. All right, let's see where we're off to this morning, Rodriguez says, switching on the patrol car's dashboard. The screen wedged between the passenger and driver's seat lights up a list of 36 calls listing the time, a numeric code, delineating the type of call, and a street address. Hey, not so bad. It's still early though, Rodriguez notes, pulling out of the station. Of the calls on the screen, 21 are coded 915, or what officially, officially is called homeless complaints. Driving to the first call, a mere five minutes from the station, we pass 11 tents and several more bodies laid out on cardboard, piles of blankets, and the hard damp concrete all violating the exact same police ordinance we're chasing after, illegal lodging. We pull up to a single tent. Rodriguez parks the car, both get out, and Sharky takes out his baton to tap on the tent pole as if not knocking on a door. Tap, 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 tap. Good morning, SFPD. Can you pop your head out for a minute? The fly unzips and a tired face emerges unfazed. Sharky continues. So I guess someone called this morning and complained about lodging here. So I guess you sat up here last night? The man nods. 
you know, business is getting started and would be great if you could just, you know, move along. Otherwise, they're going to just call again and we're going to have to respond. Without resistance or attitude, the man replies, yeah, okay, I'll get moving. Rodriguez and Sharky return to the car, clear the run, and drive on to their next call. Over the next three hours, the two officers cleared 10 homeless complaint calls. Over this time, eight more homeless calls were dispatched to the car. As we pulled back into the station for lunch, I asked the officers how they thought the morning went. Sharky admitted, look, we're not really solving anybody's problem. This is a big game of whack-a-mole. I'll clear one run, get a person to move, but by doing that, I'm just creating another call, right? If we arrested a guy, we'd never clear these calls and they'll just be out here for longer and less willing to cooperate. So I characterize this type of regulation of homelessness as complaint-oriented policing. Rather than being driven by top-down police directives aimed at hot spots or quotas or the discretion of individual officers, in San Francisco, the policing of homelessness is largely initiated by individual reports to 911 and 311, resident and business associations, and other government agencies. To zoom out, here is a map of SFPD dispatches for homelessness in an average month during 2018. It depicts the locations of over 8,000 dispatches. Between 2012 and 2017, police dispatches for homeless complaints increased by 72%, growing from just under 60,000 to nearly 100,000. Yet the city's homeless population, represented by the red line, remained relatively stable, growing 8% between 2011 to 2017. This period saw even greater increases in complaints uh, of homeless concerns to the city's 311 service line. 311 complaints grew from just under 10,000 reports a year in 2012 to nearly 85,000 in 2017. Now, the previous slide was of data on police dispatches, which represent each time a police is actually sent to an address. This data, uh, on the other hand, just represents the reports, which would be aggregated and responded to collectively. And although these calls were mainly addressed by sanitation workers, many times they would either be escorted by a police patrol car or would, could, they could call one if people uh, didn't comply. So in contrast to a policing model of aggressive patrol or zero tolerance policing that relies heavily on incarceration, um, arrests were relatively very, very rare. Um, most of the interactions went as the, as, as the one um, depicted, although I saw plenty of very aggressive um, uh, policing and abuse. Um, however, at the same time, police, nor, nor were the police shepherding the poor into shelter or services, as politicians often claim, or what some call as, uh, scholars have characterized as therapeutic policing and found um, in other uh, places. Officers repeatedly told me two mantras throughout my field work. We can't arrest our way out of this problem. And this should be a social worker's job, not a policing job. Uh, booking a person in jail would take officers off the street, reduce call response times, and build a backlog of work. And most people booked into jail would be released back onto the street in three to eight hours. Shelters were similarly understood as an ineffective means to resolve complaints. Whether officers saw homelessness as a product of pathologies or social structure, there was consensus that policing people into services was either impossible or a waste of time. As one officer explained, quote, I can take a guy to a shelter, but it's only gonna be for one night and then they're gonna be back out on the street. Some of these people are crazy or addicted and that's like a disease. Who are we kidding and thinking they'll do well sleeping bugged with 200 other guys? Policing these folks doesn't do anything to get them off the streets. If anything, it keeps them there longer. The outcome of these interactions was a constant churning of homelessness in public space. In one of our community-based surveys, we asked respondents where they relocated following their most recent move-along order. Only 9% of respondents reported moving indoors. 91% remained in public space. Now, most of the officers I got to know did not feel their policing of homelessness was particularly punitive or harsh. As one officer told me after a five hour shift chasing homeless complaints without a single citation or arrest, quote, we're just moving people around. We aren't criminalizing homelessness, flashing air quotes. Look, you've researched other cities. You've got to admit that what we're doing here is really soft glove compared to other places. So although it might be true San Francisco arrests less people on homeless related charges 
there still exists what colleagues and I have termed a pervasive penality, a punitive process of policing through move along orders, citations and threats of arrest that falls short of booking and is pervasive and is reached across a targeted population and its depth in a lingering impact. So in contrast to the frequent statements by proponents of quality of life ordinances who claim that such laws are targeted at specific behaviors and problem individuals rather than criminalizing homeless status, our community-based study found that fully 70% of respondents had been forced to move in the past year by a city official. 69% had been cited. 22% had received more than five citations in the last year. And according to court data in 2014, nearly 15,000 citations were issued for homeless specific quality of life offenses alone. When asked respondents about the outcome of their most recent citation, we found that only 10% had paid the fine. The most common outcome in 62% of the cases was not paying the ticket, which resulted in a cascade of negative impacts. A single fine, unpaid fine, resulted in a $300 assessment beyond the initial fine, revocation of a person's driver's license, a bench warrant issued for arrest, and the fine being sent to a collection agency. This negatively affected people's credit and created barriers to accessing services, housing, and work. There was even one instance during my field work where a person whose name had been on a housing wait list for three years finally came up, but due to a warrant from an unpaid citation was dropped and skipped over. However, the ultimate punishment for those I came to know on the streets was the dispossession of property at the hand of city officials. In both our community-based studies in 2014 and 2019, we found that 46% and 47% respectively of respondents reported having their belongings taken or destroyed by city employees. During my field work, individuals I resided with had lost tools, bikes, and computers used for work, expensive medicines for HIV and hepatitis C, ID and benefit cards that were key to their survival and their last remaining treasured possessions. The fear of losing shelter and one's few belongings pervaded daily routines. In the camps I resided alongside, people would rotate, uh, leaving the camp to work, attend appointments, gather food or supplies, or go to the toilet even, leaving their belongings under the watch of fellow campers. However, when a camp clearance did occur, we were limited in the amount of property we could salvage and police would often prevent us from saving others' property. Now, although most of these issues still persist, officials have implemented a number of reforms to both improve shelters and reduce the negative impacts of policing, which I will uh, move on to talk about now. So first, San Francisco opened up six new shelters during my field work. They're called navigation centers. And the first opened in the spring of 2015. And when they first opened, they were different in a number of important ways from the existing city shelters. First, they didn't have workfare or rehabilitation requirements, but are rather designed with low barrier entry with things like no curfews, 24 hour operations, and made accommodations for what officials would frequently call the three Ps, allowing pets, partners, and property. And this was all aimed at moving the hardest to shelter, uh, as they termed them, off the streets. And as seen in the previous photos, they were much more comfortably designed with smaller dormitory type settings, ample common spaces, Rather than being located in poor neighborhoods or social service ghettos, the new shelters are in gentrifying neighborhoods largely that have, homeless, that have homeless camps within the neighborhoods. Finally, when they opened up, they had no time limits and moved nearly all their clients into supportive housing. Rather than warehousing homelessness as the city's existing shelters largely did, they were truly bridging people into housing. And as I'll go on to discuss, the new shelters were initially extremely popular among those experiencing homelessness and gained broad consensus and support from advocates, politicians, community associations, and business groups. That same year, the Navigation Centers opened was the Martin versus Boise decision, which was a ruling that jurisdictions cannot prosecute those experiencing homelessness for involuntarily sitting, lying, and sleeping in public if adequate shelter isn't available. Uh, during the subsequent years, a number of criminal justice reforms were also passed, largely due to pressure from advocates I was working with, including tweaks to the 311 uh, mobile app that reduced the police dispatches, the dismissal of 60,000 warrants for unpaid fines, and the end of the practice of issuing warrants for such fines to begin with. 
The city also created an interagency task force called the Healthy Streets Operations Center to ensure a unity of effort among city departments addressing homelessness and street behaviors across San Francisco. It was also designed to be a proactive, coordinated, and a more humane approach compared to the reactive complaint-oriented policing. So as you can see on this slide presented to city supervisors by the new agency, the initiative was promoted as being led by services and public health with the police playing a secondary role. So while myself and advocates at the time saw these developments as positive, thinking that the increased shelter and criminal justice reforms would reduce the punitive experiences of those on the streets, instead policing and punishment intensified in many dimensions and most of the shelter reforms turned out to be short-lived, which leads me to my final part of the talk. So the first thing I observed was that the areas with new shelters quickly became sites of increased targeted policing. Because these shelters were being located in gentrifying areas with high levels of nimbyism, key to convincing communities to accept these shelters were promises by officials that street encampments would be reduced or even disappear. Now, with the opening of the first new shelter, there was no increased policing for its first three months. The lead police commander believed that if they opened a shelter and limited the entry of, to that shelter to only those camped within the specific neighborhood, tents would decrease, people would move inside, complaints and 911 calls to address homelessness would decrease, and policing would decrease. This didn't happen. And this was not due to the shelter's failure of meeting the needs of those unhoused, but rather its success in doing so. Because the six shelters were so popular and considered better than the existing system, people actually started setting up camp in the neighborhood to get into the shelter. Police and social workers began sending people into the neighborhood as well. In the end, encampments increased and so did compliance. So in reaction, the city responded by assigning more police and sanitation crews to respond to 911 and 311 homeless complaints. And in the past two years, increased policing is no longer a reactionary measure, but instead an upfront condition of the community contract with proactive police patrols. Now, each new shelter also comes along with four additional officers to patrol the surrounding blocks and a dedicated sanitation team servicing an official safe zone. Now, this ended up also inflaming social conflicts among those unhoused. So here's a quote from uh, Ben, who I... I came to know on the streets over a number of years. He'd not only been recycling and living outside in the Mission neighborhood where the first new shelter opened, um, where he had been living two years prior to its opening. Before becoming homeless, he had been renting in the neighborhood for more than a decade. Frustrated with his inability to get a bed at the new shelter, he complained to me, quote, how am I supposed to get into the navigation center? I know dozens of folks who I'd never seen in this neighborhood get inside and get beds, and I've been here for ages. Now we've got all these new people camping out. They've got no respect for us who've been here before. Lots of math, they make way too much noise, hoarding all this sorts of crap. Just look at the couple across the street. He points to a disheveled camp that has three bikes in various stages of deconstruction. They just moved here yesterday. Now they're gonna bring the heat on me, meaning police pressure. And I bet they'll get navigation center beds. They love getting in the most fucked up folks out here inside. I'm just not fucked up enough. I think I've moved more in the past two months than I have in the past two years. So as Ben's sentiments reflect, the new shelter was a source of resentment and division between the house list. There was frustration over the criterion of selection, a frustration compounded by the fact that the new shelters they wanted to enter but couldn't resulted in increased policing. And this heightened policing converted every new homeless person on the block into a threat of visibility, complaints, and eventually eviction. Soon after this conversation, Ben relocated his camp to the Bayview neighborhood. Rather than contributing to ending Ben's homelessness, the reactionary policing that followed the navigation center's opening resulted instead in an eviction from his longtime neighborhood. Another development was that shelters shifted from serving the needs of people experiencing homelessness to the needs of the police. This was due in large part due to the Martin versus Boise decision, which ruled that police cannot enforce laws prohibiting homelessness in public space unless shelter is available. Now this created a legal dilemma for the police. How are police able to enforce anti-homeless laws when there is a month long wait list for shelters and the high demand for referrals into the new navigation shelters? To overcome this challenge of regulating homelessness in public space, 
officials found a fix through regressive policy adjustments to shelters. First is that since police officers are required by law now to offer a shelter bed enforcing these laws, the referrals for these beds increasingly shifted from social workers to police officers. So police officers now always have priority to shelter bed placements on hand in order so that they can enforce anti-homeless laws. Because the beds are required to enforce the law, shelters were made less desirable with shorter stays to increase turnover and increase rates of rejection. From the Public Record Act request, we discovered that while originally 95% of the new shelter beds were designated for pathways to housing in 2015, by 2018, less than 10% were designated for this purpose. The rest were for short-term stays, less than a month, many for just a week or less, with most sheltered guests being discharged to the streets. So the options presented to many unsheltered homeless folks uh, when ordered to move was either go to a shelter for a week and surrender all your belongings, which are no longer allowed in most of the navigation centers, or move along and surrender your tent, or get a citation, possibly face arrest. Now, meanwhile, the Healthy Streets Operations Center ended up not being led by services in a public health approach. The operation commander of the center directing dispatched ended up being a police commander. The SFPD more than doubled the number of officers assigned to address homelessness that were then tied to this new operations center and uh, largely ended up accompanying sanitation crews. So if you were to call 311 because of an encampment, there'd be a higher chance than before that police would be with that sanitation team. The primary metric used by the center is a tent count as highlighted in this email. In most camp resolutions, the Department of Homelessness and Public Health were not involved due to a lack of resources. Services beyond a short-term shelter bed were rarely offered. So besides observing this on the streets all the time, dozens of internal emails like this one from our Public Record Act request shows the Director of Homelessness giving the green flag, green light to SFPD and sanitation operations when services or outreach staff were not available, which was all too frequent. One result was that the public health street outreach workers felt their resources had been hijacked by police. Social workers expressed frustration that shelter placements were being driven by complaints of housed residents rather than the physical and behavioral health needs of specific clients. Not only did this policy shift divert social services, it actually undermined their efficacy. The main impact of the Healthy Streets Operations Center were more frequent sweeps that resulted in greater property loss. Although unsheltered homelessness increased in San Francisco by 15% between 27 and 15, 2017 and 2019, tents decreased by 30%. It was common for people to miss appointments with social workers to protect their property, which would result in their benefits lapsing. Outreach workers like Jason photographed here were regularly frustrated when clients lost access to medicine or services from the sweeps. Other times, outreach workers could not locate their clients on the streets to distribute medicine or notify them they'd been granted access to shelter, rehab, or even housing due to the sweeps. Um, in, uh, in another case, uh, we'd be out, uh, I'd be out with the social workers, and there would be uh, specific clients who had uh, numerous uh, psychiatric and um, health issues that they've been trying to get into um, a navigation center so that they could end up getting the housing placement. And then they would be diverted later that same day to clear an encampment um, due to complaints where people with far less needs would be um, put in these spaces, which would cause intense frustration uh, at the system among these social workers. Uh, Neil, who is pictured here and who I followed for three years on the streets until he passed away in 2017, had his walker crushed in a dump truck, despite the fact that those presents told sanitation workers and police officers that he was hospitalized. During my observations with public health workers on street outreach and while residing in camps, I witnessed people refuse hospitalization in the face of gruesome infections, debilitating pain, and churning stomach sicknesses, primarily out of this fear of losing their belongings at the hands of city workers. Uh, one of my researcher companions, an African-American in his 70s, who I spent dozens of nights recycling with and who had previously lost all his property while hospitalized, called my cell phone one afternoon, laying on the sidewalk, unable to stand as a stroke was setting in. Before calling 911, he wanted to see if I was in the city and could go to the camp to watch his property before he was taken to the ER. Uh, 
So in these ways, the criminalization of homelessness undermined other state efforts of socialization and medicalization, as well as individuals' personal efforts to pull themselves out of homelessness. And so I'll just conclude with a few policy implications of this study that I believe are especially relevant uh, to many US cities today, but particularly California, um, as we're discussing uh, these new policy proposals of shelter and policing. First is that the study highlights how increased criminalization undermines the goals and efforts of new shelters and social service provision aimed at addressing homeless persons' needs in favor of house people's complaints. So therefore, in contrast to this current bipartisan policy program, and we're seeing basically everywhere of simultaneously rolling out new shelters and increasing policing, it's essential to do the opposite or at least roll out shelters and housing to the fullest extent of which there is voluntary uptake um, before moving towards um, uh, engaging with um, policing. So we need the decrease of criminalization, especially when opening new shelters. Um, not the other way around. Um, next is that the recent Martin v. Boise court decision is not decriminalizing homelessness. It's simply changing how criminalization occurs. It's critical for scholars and journalists to document the legal workaround cities are now working on to continue viola violating people's constitutional rights. It's also critical to look beyond incarceration when we talk about criminal justice reform. We need to recognize how even if we do see positive reductions in mass incarceration, those experiencing homelessness may still experience expanding mass criminalization on our streets. And, and finally has been, which has been increasingly important during this pandemic, is that we need to detach criminalization from the growing sanitary and public health efforts around homeless encampments. So in my articles, I describe how San Francisco, like many cities, is now using discourses and resources of public health and sanitation agencies to ramp up police enforcement, uh, often also to disguise police enforcement of anti-homeless laws and to dispossess people of their property. And as I've, I've, I've shown, this actually increases both the medical risks of individuals and the public health risks of the broader community. And um, I'm happy to talk about more alternatives out there, but I want to highlight one, um, which is uh, a program that was developed over months with a large group of community organizations and um, some academics in the Bay Area called the Compassionate Alternative Response Team. Um, and there's a, a web link there. But um, this is based off of a model many of you might be, I might have heard of coming out of Eugene called the CAHOOTS program, which is basically to shift the dispatch um, of the first response to homelessness of not being a police officer, uh, but rather a social worker team. And often, and as we've designed it uh, and are promoting in San Francisco, one that would also have a, um, a peer of someone who's experienced homelessness as the, in the first response. Um, and we've gotten um, oh, nearly $7 million in funding from San Francisco's Board of Supervisors right now. Uh, however, uh, right now the mayor is focused on their specific mental health response team uh, to policing, um, which is a positive development, but is not addressing these broader calls. Of course, you know, this is only going to uh, I won't say only because I've shown you know, the numerous impacts of the negative impacts of policing here, um, but would free up these resources to also look at you know, some of the other alternatives and housing and supportive shelter, which I'm also excited to talk about in the Q&A. So thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Anne to moderate the questions. Great, thank you so much, Chris. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, and I think from the comments in the chat, it's you know a lot of people's questions and comments and discussion are focused on these policy solutions. I'm gonna take my moderator's prerogative to ask a couple of questions and then I'll um, reflect a little bit more directly some of the questions in the chat. So my first question for you is, you know, have you had the opportunity to share, I think your, your work does, I think, an amazing job of really unpacking the mechanisms and the processes and kind of the nuts and bolts of what, how these policies actually play out um, in, in the, you know, on the streets and in, in the real world. And I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity to share um, your research with San Francisco policymakers and what their response has been. Yes. Um, one of the, I think, strengths of um, you know, not just doing the observations with 
policymakers and especially with community organizers um, is uh, you know having uh, the platform to dis to discuss this with the policymakers and especially I would say with the work with the coalition on homelessness. So um, many of those reforms that I mentioned um, were actually driven by um, some of uh, our first community-based report, which we did in 2015, where you saw some of these survey findings. Um, we were able to meet with all the city supervisors and discuss these findings to get a, um, uh, a government accountability office to, for the first time, assess how much money was being spent in the city. Um, and then to get hearings around, you know, how we could change this, including uh, working with the Financial Justice Project in the San Francisco Treasurer's Office to get rid of those um, uh, uh, warrants and citations, which was actually done under um, uh, uh, the district attorney now in Los Angeles, uh, uh, George Cascon. So, um, and, and so the, a lot of those reforms were built off of that research. Also, the 311 app. Uh, it used to have multiple options for people to report like on a wellness check to get uh, uh, a response of a wellness check. All those wellness checks were being sent to the police, uh, which wasn't working for anyone. So we got that taken off. So it's been an iterative process of seeing how we make these small adjustments and tweaks. And one of the lessons I take and, and, and try to show from this is that although uh, you know, these minor reforms have, uh, you know, relieved the impact of criminalization on um, those experiencing homelessness, um, it still persists and it grows in new ways. And it's this constant process of which when the political pressure is on, we do not have the social safety net infrastructure to respond to this crisis. And yet we have an immense amount of policing resources who are the service of last resort, right? It's police and the EMT medics who go pick these folks up. And so um, to me, I'm, I, I think that this research and even San Francisco is showing that even when we are making these good faith changes, that we do need a much more structural change uh, to have an impact, which has led me to believe that we really do need to disattach the dispatch completely from police um, and then you know start developing the welfare state infrastructure that is actually going to respond to this. Um, and so uh, yeah, that, that those are just some of the you know improvements. Um, I can speak to specific other people's questions uh, you know in the experiences of the exchanges I've had with officials of why they will or why they won't do that. Great, thank you. Um, I'm you know, I think here in California, especially, uh, and in LA too, um, you know, homelessness has grown. Encampments are are more visible. Uh, we've passed a number of um, tax increases and other policies. You know, to, you know, towards support for um, increasing housing. And I think you know, you hear more and more that people are sort of getting fed up. Uh, and you know, what are policymakers doing? And I I want to push a little bit. So your you know your policy recommendation slide. The first bullet said roll out services and roll back criminaliz criminalization. And the second bullet was sort of about um, orienting response towards the needs of the homeless population and not um, the complaints of residents. And I, you know, take those points well. I was wondering though, you know, in the in the case you described of the navigation center rollout, you know, it sort of seemed like these, you know, shelters were additional services. Um, you know, perhaps because of the neighborhoods they were placed in, they warranted uh, more complaints. Uh, it sort of, you know, people moved there to try to get into these shelters. Like, what would that, what would a better rollout of that have looked like to avoid uh, the situation where those shelters ended up being kind of our pathway to more um, punitive measures? Is there a way we can take that case and think about like, Okay, on paper it's great. There's like new shelters. There's more beds, but like it didn't go. It didn't go well. So what would what would have been, what would have gone better? Well, I will say like the first year it was still looking really good, and myself and the advocates were supporting it. We were frustrated that the only way to get into these shelters was that you had to be camping in the neighborhood, right? And um, and that was tied to this notion of like, if our, if our, if our neighborhood's going to take this like negative externality of a shelter, then we deserve the benefit of it. And so I think what, you know, um, it, it points to in that is that these need to be uh, ideally more citywide efforts. If we could open up as we have now more of these, but even as we open them up, that we're not just 
deciding that we're letting folks into these shelters because you're camping in a specific spot, but through other forms of eligibility criteria. And there are problems with all of them, but I will say that in LA and San Francisco, there's been a big investment into new tools, which are highly problematic of vulnerabilities, but are at least in the hands of like public health and social workers, right? Who would be able to be basing the referrals on, on, on this. Um, and so I think that would definitely um, have prevented this idea that if you move into this area that you'll, you know, get the specific bad. Um, but it, it also shows the degree of which, uh, you know, this infrastructure needs to be built out and made widely accessible. Right now, these are used as one-off pilot projects that don't scale, that are often used to then divert the attention from the broader criminalization that is actually making tents disappear rather than the small shelter that might take in a hundred people. Uh, and too often the stories we read in the newspapers are as we associate this new shelter as being responsible for the reduction of tents uh, in specific areas when the folks on the ground who are with folks realize that maybe a hundred people get in and 400 people get evicted. We need to switch the side of that uh, equation. Thanks. Okay, I want to read some of the questions from the chat now. So Michael Huff had asked earlier specifically about uh, mental illness, which I am sure sort of threads through some of this, but I don't know if I heard you direct it directly. And so they asked, how do we ensure that treating the unhoused experiencing mental illness does not become a new type of incarceration? Note, it is more difficult to gain release from a mental health facility uh, than a prison. Would love to hear any reflections on that specific issue. Yeah. First, uh, that's a great question. And I think that, uh, again, we should start with recognizing the dearth of uh, services that are first voluntarily available, and then the quality of those services for mental health that are available. And I, I point folks to, um, it's on my website, but you can also Google it. It's a needs assessment study uh, that I did with a number of other academics in San Francisco called Stop the Revolving Door. And uh, in it, we, we, you know, we surveyed some 600 unhoused San Franciscans, both in the shelters and on the streets, about their experiences uh, with uh, mental health and behavioral health services. And what we found was that um, um, first, a number of people, people seeking um, this, these treatments have been unable to get it, particularly residential treatments. And many who do get residential treatment for both behavioral uh, and drug uh, rehab, but then also mental health. Um, uh, nearly half of them end up back on the street. And it's very hard to recover or to maintain that recovery that, that in some cases were successful or meaningful when they're back on the street. And, um, and so housing is, is key to that and providing that. And so there are efforts uh, in San Francisco, there's Mental Health SF that's being supported by progressive supervisors uh, to invest in expanding the number of psychiatric beds and hospitals, which have been decreasing and prevents even uh, folks getting the care they need at that point, um, as well as other things like board and care homes and resident, more residential uh, treatment. Uh, we need to first expand the voluntary options um, to, to just see how much that takes the pressure off the streets. You know, right now we're leading, or we think that somehow by making the more mandatory um, forms first is going to solve the problem or with policing. And I mean, look at the new conservatorship debate in San Francisco uh, and the state more broadly. I mean, no matter how you change that law, at the end of the day, it's not going to have any effect unless there are placements for people in hospitals and from the hospitals to be discharged. Um, and, um, and so it's first a question of resources. And first, I think we need to begin with those that are voluntarily available um, before we begin having this discussion about the mandated ones. And just to say one more thing on that is that if we do push the mandated services first, for instance, in San Francisco, our community support systems and the alternative sentencing, um, for people to get some of these residential treatments, the main way you get them is by going to court and being mandated through them. And so if, if we're expanding that, we're taking resources from those that are voluntarily available, where people are on wait lists, so if we're not expanding the pie, um, we're just diverting them, you know, within this system and, and reducing our already very limited voluntary services that people are seeking. 
Thanks. I want to pair this with a question that just popped up from Jesse Gold here, and then I'll circle back to an earlier question about policy. Um, so Jesse uh, is asks about another population that needs additional, um, you sort of mentioned behavioral health and other services. So they write, Dr. Harry, and I'm curious to know if during your ethnographic work, you noticed differences in treatment by law enforcement and shelter systems between unhoused people who used and did not use drugs. Additionally, was substance use something frequently cited by house residents as an eyesore, even when it wasn't actually occurring nearby? Yeah, I mean, um, there are is lots of individual discretion um, among social workers uh, and police officers, as as many other you know ethnographers of uh, frontline workers have found that you know will affect the approach. I will say though that you know the the main points uh, of uh, of where the law enforcement uh, re like re reacted um, more more aggressively. Um, would be in cases of which um, th there were, and also uh, sanitation workers where they would like just throw, throw away goods had more to do with their perceptions of, is this camp um, well-maintained? Uh, is it uh, clean? <laughs> is it uh, what, you know, well-organized and are folks cooperating? And um, the ways in which that, um, you know, drug use uh, often interfered with that uh, would be in cases where, um, you know, either depending on w w if folks were being, uh, you know, approached on methamphetamines and there was increased aggression, or if people were, uh, you know, um, unable to respond due to, you know, alcohol or, uh, you know, opioid use and other things, this would uh, then result in, um, uh, more, more aggressive or, you know, punitive responses of taking um, uh, folks' property. W with the social workers, there was a sense in the distribution of services and shelters, um, less like stigma and stigma. And this is in San Francisco, mind you, but, um, you know, of thinking, is this person going to be okay moving into, say, a hotel room or a housing unit? Um, while they're using it with the door closed behind them in the midst of our overdose, you know, uh, situation. And so there would be actually cases uh, where we still are applying to some degree on the individual caseworker level, a notion of housing readiness, like, is this person ready to move inside? Um, and so it was, it was more of those type of um, discretionary uh, calculus that I was seeing on the side of the social workers I worked with in San Francisco than um, those that we often hear about, and I'm sure are widespread as I read in other parts of the country, of uh, the stigma uh, associated with um, negative stigma associated with drug users who are therefore undeserving of, say, getting this housing. Thank you. And for our final question, I'll circle back to a question from Tim McCormick earlier, and they're asking about the possibility of increased services like shelters being paired with commitments to reduce issues that are of concern to other residents. So for example, disallowing unpermit unpermitted encampments on public space if more shelters are provided. And so they ask, what are politically viable alternatives to present practices that might do this sort of pairing um, that, for example, San Francisco or Sacramento could enact? Yeah, I mean, that is the way in which uh, the debate is, uh, you know, um, being uh, framed and thought of that for political viability, uh, we need to have both the shelter and policing. And it's premised on this misperception of how much more shelter and alternative spaces are necessary uh, for those unhoused and the um, how, how much demand there is for an alternative, whether that is um, a shelter, whether that is uh, an organized encampment, or whether that is just space of which they folks can exist without being um, uh, penalized. And so I think that um, what, what we need from our politicians and experts is a big dose of, you know, honesty and a reality check of uh, how much is really necessary um, to address this and how negative uh, the policing uh, of the of these issues results in, and how short term uh, you know the, these gains are, um, and so I, I would just say that you know at some point, and in European cities, you know they get to this point where the, there or where there the, there is enough <laughs> adequate and humane uh, uh, shelter uh, that the, the problem is greatly reduced simply through um, those those provisions and. Um, 
I think that's the, the basis that we need to be uh, working towards before uh, we start coming out with the more uh, policing and punitive alt ultimatums. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This was really fascinating. I'm going to pop your, your website in the chat here. There's more there for folks interested on um, some of the work and the reports that Chris has referenced and, and more information about some of the policies um, that he referenced as well. Um, so thanks so much. Um, thanks for everyone for participating in the chat and um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks.